Sapphire, Sapphire. Yes, yes, children. I'll tell you a story. Just place it right there. But gather around the campfire, and I'll talk to you about Moses, who was one of the great leaders of our people. He was a great leader in the time of the Egyptian pharaohs. A pharaoh is a king, and he was also seen as an Egyptian god. Yes, Reuben, for our people, we have one God, one holy one. But in the time of Moses, the Egyptians worshipped multiple gods. And in the time of Moses, the people our people were slaves in Egypt. Yes, Deborah? Why were we slaves in Egypt? There had been a long period of time when there was no rain. And so there was a drought across the land and crops wouldn't grow, so they didn't have any food. So our people traveled and moved to Egypt where there was food. Now, after they were there for many, many years, the Egyptians made them slaves. And they were very unkind to their slaves. And Moses, um, later he's going to take part in speaking out to those Egyptian slaves. Pharaoh was so afraid of the Hebrew people because they had grown and grown and there were tens of thousands of Hebrews living in Egypt. And he was afraid that they would revolt and overthrow his kingdom. So he spoke to the midwives who delivered the Hebrew babies and told them to drown all the boy babies, but it was okay to let the girl babies live. Yeah, it is kind of wrong, isn't it? But the midwives respected Yahweh, so they let the boy babies live. So Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, whenever you see a Hebrew baby boy, drown him, but let the girls live. Well, one day, a Hebrew woman had a son. So she hid him for as long as she could. He was three months old, and she took a big reed basket and sealed it with tar so it was waterproof. She put her baby into the basket and closed the lid, and she set the basket along the reeds in the Nile River. The woman's older daughter stayed to watch to see what would happen. They knew it was an era, area of the river where Pharaoh's daughter would come to bathe. And she did. With her women servants, she came down to the Nile River to bathe. And she noticed that basket over in the reeds. And she said, bring the basket to me. Well, when she opened it and she saw the Hebrew baby boy, she decided to adopt him. And she named him Moses, because it means to draw from the water. And so Moses was raised as an Egyptian prince. He became a leader of the people in, in years to come. We will hear about that. But right now, what he did was he saw how mean that the Egyptian taskmakers were, and he saw an Egyptian foreman beating up one of the Hebrew workers. And he was so concerned that he attacked the foreman, and he ended up killing this Egyptian. When Pharaoh heard about it, he sent men to kill Moses because a Hebrew man was certainly not supposed to attack and kill an Egyptian male. So what did Moses do? He fled. He fled across the desert to the land of Midian. 
and there he met Jethro, a prince of Midian. He married Zipporah, one of Zethro's seven daughters, and went to work as a shepherd for his father-in-law. So many years later, Moses is out watching the flock, and he takes him to the edge of the desert to God's mountain, which was called Horeb, or Sinai. And there, a messenger of God was seen in a flame, in the middle of a flame. Moses thought that was a little bit strange to see a flame in a bush, and the bush wasn't burning up. A bush that does not burn? How is that possible? Well, Moses wondered about that too. So he walked a little closer to it, and Yahweh spoke his name. Moses, Moses. I am here. The Lord said, Stop, and do not come any closer. Remove your sandals, for the ground you're standing on is holy ground. I am the God of your father, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. I know why he was afraid. Why was he afraid? Yes, Miriam, that is what we believe. To look on the face of God is to die. Then Moses said, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Well, I have seen their pain, I have seen their suffering, and how they have been oppressed by, oppressed by the Egyptians. And so I have come to rescue them, and I am sending you, Moses, to speak to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to tell him to let my people, the Israelites, go. So you will be my spokesperson and speak to Pharaoh. Yahweh said, do not be afraid to speak because I will be with you. But Moses argued with God and said, oh, I cannot be your messenger. I stutter, and he had a whole list of other reasons on why he could not be God's messenger, but he finally accepted his call and said that he would go. So with his brother Aaron, they left to go to Egypt to tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. So what about you guys? When you're out wandering around in the forest or all, have you ever seen a burning bush that would not burn up? No, not at all. How would you, what would you do, Arden, in place of Sarah, excuse me, Sarah? Uh, what would you do if you saw a burning bush that did not burn up? I think it would scare me. You'd be scared? Mm -hmm. Bryce, how would you? Excuse me, Esther, how would you feel if you saw a burning bush? You think it was witchcraft. Do any of you others have any ideas about what? Okay, what about you, Reuben? Mm, I think it would be cool and yet scary. It's cool and scary. What about you? I would think it would be amazing. M amazing. That's a good one, Miriam. Yes, Deborah. You would wonder why it wasn't burning and studying it. Well, those are all really wonderful responses. I think that it would be kind of crazy and pretty amazing to see a burning bush that did not burn up. So now, children, why don't you gather your blankets and go and get settled down for the evening? I think we oftentimes get caught up with that image of a bush that will not burn. But maybe, just think about it for a moment, what if what is important is that Moses stopped? He stopped for a moment 
He looked and he listened. He listened to God. He even argued with God and debated with God. Now, I'm not sure if I was encountering God's voice in a burning bush or anywhere else that I would be brave enough, bold enough, foolish enough, scared enough, maybe, to debate and to argue with the Holy One. But Moses had excuses. I cannot be your messenger. I cannot go. I stutter. Who's going to listen to a, a man who stutters? He believed that he was not capable of being one who could stand before Pharaoh and demand him to let the Hebrew slaves be free. He thought that to task them about their um, oppression was something that he was just not the, the person to go and do that and to speak out against that mistreatment. But Yahweh said to Moses, do not be afraid. I will be there with you. You will not be alone. So sometimes, as children or as adults, we are asked to do things that we're afraid to do. School is getting into full swing, and maybe when you get to school, you're afraid to talk to one of the new kids in your class. Maybe an adult might be at work and has a new coworker, and they're afraid to talk to that coworker because they speak with a funny accent and they don't look the way that he or she looks, and so they're really reluctant to speak to them. Maybe when you're at school, you see a student being bullied by another student, and you're afraid to speak up. Maybe your friends will make fun of you and laugh at you, or maybe you'll lose your friends. An adult might be at work and hear he or she, but hear their employer speak and say things that are very uncomplimentary and derogatory about an employee who has a different skin color. And that you're afraid to speak up because you don't know, gee, maybe I might lose my job. We're all sometimes afraid. Our legs may be shaky, we may feel like we're going to faint, but sometimes we need to speak up, even though we are scared. But remember that when you're afraid, you're not alone. Think of Greta Thunberg. She, was a youth, she is a youth environmental activist. She stood before the United Nations summit meeting and gave a passionate speech about global climate change. Think how scary for a teenager that must have been for her to call the entire global community to task over global climate change. And then there are the students at Parkland, Florida. They co-founded a Never Again Foundation to fight for the end of gun violence following the massive shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School there. In the midst of their, their grief, their pain, their anger, they stood before the Florida legislature and they put out their case. And because of that, a state public law was passed. And what about the boy, Jalen Arnold, he has turret syndrome, Asperger's, and OCD. He was bullied at school because he was different. And that bullying created anxiety in him, which emphasized and created more symptoms for him. So Jalen founded the Jalen Challenge Foundation. And through that foundation, he has already educated more than 100,000 students and so that they recognize be, uh, bullying behavior. And he has also helped them to understand people 
with differences and that they're all, we're all okay. We're just different. Think how terrifying it must have been for Sojourner Truth, a black woman who was born as a slave. And she escaped, and she went to court and sued a white man to recover her son. She was the first black woman to win her case, to win any case against a black woman and a white man. She became an abolitionist and spoke out on the rights of women. Then there is Esmeralda Simmons. She works for equal rights in education, in quality education for students of color, and she has founded the Center for Law and Social Justice. And Winona LaDuke, she is a Native American. She has dedicated her life to speak up for American, Native American land rights, climate change, and environmental justice. These youth and adults, they never f had felt probably like their activism and this, uh, was a response to a divine call to ministry. They may not have experienced that the people who became supporters of them and joined in their causes, maybe that was possibly the divine one walking with them and supporting them and giving them care. We may never have a burning bush moment. We may never have a road to Damascus moment like Paul did on the way to Damascus. Moses, he never envisioned himself as one who would break the bonds of slavery of the Egyptian people and that he would go on to later lead them to a new land and to a new community. Paul, he did not envision that one who was persecuting the Christians would one day be a great Christian leader. We may not be in a line for, you know, one of those Cecil B. DeMille moments. Now, I know some of you have no idea who Cecil B. DeMille is, but if you ever watch the, tone, the Ten Commandments, that's his movie. Just remember, it's not history. It's a story. But we may be, I believe, called, all of us, every day, every moment, many times, in many different ways. We get caught up in our lives. But I believe that though many of you may feel, well, you know, there are some who are called to ministry, and there are some who are called to be missionaries, but I'm not called in my job and in what I do. But I think you are. I think we all are. I think that many teachers, medical workers, that volunteers, and a host of others are called into their ministry, into their mission, in many different ways and at many different times. When you receive your call, will you, like Moses, have a long list of excuses that, oh, uh, I, I don't, I, I, I just wouldn't know what to say. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm just, I can't, I couldn't stand up in front of people and talk. Uh, you know, um, I don't have a plan or I'm too old, or I'm too young, and so forth. A list of excuses on why you cannot be God's messenger. But you know, maybe you might also come to the point where you, like Moses, will be able to say, I am here. We are called into ministry. Maybe sometimes... It's in a little way, maybe just to smile at someone or to just go and sit silently with them. Or maybe you're called in a more vivid way. Maybe you will have that burning bush kind of moment where you are called to stand before a city council and speak out and say, we need to ban single-use plastic bags. Many ways we are called, some tiny, 
some big. Will you be able to stop and take the moment and listen? You know, Moses was called on an ordinary day as an ordinary man doing ordinary work. But he stopped, took a moment to look, to listen, and to accept his call. Yes, he did argue and debate first, but he finally accepted, I am called to do this, and it will be okay, because God is with me. So when you accept your call, whether it's a big, whether it's small, remember you're not alone. That those people who come around you, who join your cause, who listen to you, who support you, maybe they too are that divine presence supporting you and encouraging you so that when you say, I am here, you are not alone. Moses, when he said that, was told, you're standing on holy ground. God is the ground of our being. So take that moment to stand in the presence of the divine. Take that moment to know that you are not alone and God will go with you.